Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, babies in their diapers, welcome to the Tiberia Show with your host, Tiberius Boy! That's me, Tiberius! Today, we're going to talk about some very awesome stuff. We have a VR game about stealing acorns, the second book about the city of Ember, and we have a totally awesome guest. Today, we have the one, the only, the amazing Brian Sype. Brian is a specialty makeup artist at Gamut Studios and works on making characters in movies look real. Yes. Yes, that's what I do. Real. Wow. Well, today, we're going to start off with the video of the week, and this is going to be a squirrel. And now it's time for the video game of the week. Today's video game is Acron Attack of the Squirrels. This is given by Resolution Games, and it's on the Steam platform. This game is available if you're using a VR system or a mobile device. This is a game where you have a VR headset, you're a tree trying to protect your golden acorns that are around you. If you're on a mobile device, you're a squirrel trying to steal the tree's golden acorns. Because you want them golden acorns. <laughs> so first off, I get in the game on my phone, and I actually like a lobby where you can put in a six-digit code and your name, but I have to wait for the VR person. Now, when you're the VR person, you're in a world, and you are a tree, and you are the owner of your world. You can make the game options and generate the code where the people on mobile can join. After you give out the code, you, you can have up to eight friends, and you can start the game. Now, each of the squirrels on their mobile devices are allowed to pick their squirrel type. Well, there are four different squirrels. Zip, Sim, Doug, and Chunk. Zip's ability is to be really, really fast, kind of like zipping around. Next, Sim's ability is able to make staircases out of wood. Everyone can use Sim's uh, staircases in order to get up high. Then you have Doug. He can dig holes for all of the squirrels to go through without getting hit by the tree. Last, Chunk is a big shield that can block two to three rocks and boulders from the tree. Then, you're supposed to use your abilities in order to steal the acorns and get them back to your home base. For the tree, it's a whole lot harder. So the tree starts the game, and there are three types of weapons slash items that can KO or slow down this world. So first, the middle one is a rock. It's the basic rock, and you can throw it at the squirrels. If it hits one, then they're KO'd, and they have to start back at their base. Next, with a big boulder, you can throw it, and it's heavier, and it stays around until the end of the game. Oh, and if you throw a rock at the boulder, it explodes and, kill and KOs all the squirrels around it. Finally, you got the goo ball. This is like the easiest to explain because it splats when it hits the ground. And then when the squirrel touches it, they're just slowed down dramatically, making them an easy target for a tree. Well, I got my dad to play it with me. And while I was always the tree, I won 90% of the time. There was one time that he won in sudden death. It was crazy. He had three acorns out of four acorns. And I was just trying to whack him. And he was just dug digging holes. And I'm like, what? <laughs> But it's so much fun to play against a lot of real people. Well, I give Acron Attack of the Squirrels 20 out of 10 stars because I like knocking out little squirrels. And it really helps as the mobile version of the game is free. So it's easier to find friends to attack your tree. And now it's time for the book of the week, City of Ember, The People of Sparks. This book is written by Jan DeProw. Lambert's to the back of the book. In fact, Brian, would you like to do the honors? I would, thank you. Lena and Dune helped the city, citizens of Ember escape the city that threatened to destroy them. They've been given safe haven in a small village called Sparks, a place filled with color and light. But they're not out of danger yet. Although Sparks seems like the answer the long suffering Ember rights have been hoping for, tempers soon escalate. Ooh. Well, this is an Arabic for six whole points. It's rated for fourth grade and third month. This is a book about refugees and a living ho living in a home that's like in a dome, underground. So we start with the little backstory. 
So there was a city made underground where the people have been there for over 200 years. Have never seen the sun, nor the moon, or the grass. Nothing. Well, in the first book, Lena and Dune, little kids, found a way out of the city. A few days later, Lena, Dune, and Poppy, Lena's younger sister, made it outside onto grasslands and see the sun and the moon for the first time. Wow. You think they would get immediately suntanned for sunburn? Not sure. Mm -hmm. But now it's been a couple of days since I somehow survived, and the whole city of Ember has made it out to the outside world, and they realize it's a whole lot harder to live out there than in Ember because of all the seasons, the rain, and thunderstorms. (laughs) Now, they might have gotten out of Ember, well, because Lena and Dune took a note and strapped it to a rock with instructions on how to get out, and they threw it down to Ember, and Lena's permanent babysitter found the note on accident and read it and got everyone out of Ember like that. Boom. Now, they find a city called Sparks, and the mayor of that land was confused with so many people at once. No one believes them about a city underground, and they they decided to allow them to stay in an abandoned hotel. Some people took Emberites in their own home, and all shared their food. They got to taste all sorts of new types of food, and later on, Lena was living with the doctor because Poppy was sick and some of the citizens of Sparks were not happy about sharing their resources with the Emberites. They didn't even want the people from Ember. And then, it got into an all-out... Wait, I think I said a bit too much. But I want you to read the book yourself, and you figure out what's happening right then and there. Well, I give the city of Ember, the people of Sparks, 8 out of 10 stars, because it was a great book, and I can't wait to read the third book in the series. Alright, can we talk about this for a second? Because I have a question. Sure. Well, like that. I mean, could you imagine if you were lived your whole life underground and you didn't see the sun? Like, what would your skin even look like? This is what I think of. They were perfect. pale. I would think, you know, like, how can that be? They would be pale to the point of almost translucent. Um, I would think. But, and then the second they saw sun, you know, that's going to uh, yeah. affect their skin and everything. It would burn their eyes. I mean... I mean, they were underground for over 200 years. Yeah, so... They somehow had enough food, electricity. Because they were underground, they had to have electricity. So even the DNA passed through, like, their bodies were not even, like, capable of dealing with the sun. Yeah. With air, rain, anything. Yeah. So... Nothing. It's funny they didn't just screw and die the second they got out. But Yeah, confusing. Yeah, all right. SteveSmithLaw.com. You can call him at 407 801 2667. Wait, you are not Chuck. My dad can help when people get hurt. He loves to help people. If you are ever injured at work or in a car accident, you should call my friend Chuck. You can call him at 407 801 2667. That website again is SteveSmithLaw.com. Offices, Orlando. Does it actually have that much W's? <laughs> And now it's time for an interview of an interesting person. Today, this is going to be so much fun. Today, we have the one, the only, the amazing, Brian Sype. Brian is a special t- specialty makeup artist at Gamut Studios and works on making characters and movies look real. Yes, yes. Am I supposed to interject myself there? Um, yes, reality <laughs> is uh, making things not real, real. It's something that I do like to do. Hmm. So first off, how are you enjoying being on the show? Uh, so far, so good. It's fun. Sweet. Okay, so you realize that it's a specialty makeup artist. Can yes. you explain to my listeners exactly what that means? Um, specialty makeup artist is anything. It can be anything, really. Um, I've started out my career as a special effects makeup artist, but I found that it soon held a certain connotation and special effects makeup artists, all of a sudden everybody's like, oh, here come the blood and guts guys, here come this. But, you know, what we end up doing is, you know, making Brad Pitt look old uh, Mm. or making, you know, Jennifer Lawrence into Bastique. So it's not necessarily a blood and guts thing. Uh, So I kind of pushed 
my own my own title of specialty makeup artist just because I, I thought it had a better feel to it than just to the pigeonhole and to the blood. Which huh. That's what everybody thinks that we do. We don't. We make things <laughs> yeah, look you actually real. make things look real. Yeah. Yeah. That so, should be my new title. Specialty makeup artist. <laughs> made things look real. Yeah, that makes sense. I like that. <laughs> so do you only work on TV or movies? Uh, no, no, no. I, I mean, I've... I've worked on the- worked in theater, worked uh, mm-hmm. live things, you know, help people just uh, wherever we go. We're kind of a uh, gun for hire. Wow. So what is the difference between prosthetic makeup and non-prosthetic makeup? Uh, prosthetic makeup is anything that you add to somebody's face, features, body uh, that changes their appearance. Okay. You know, nose, um, it's nebulous whether or not a tattoo is considered a prosthetic because mm. you do add that it doesn't actually stick out from their person so but uh teeth ears nose a hump uh old age, anything you glue to somebody's face would be considered a prosthetic huh so if you accidentally glue a piece of tape to a yeah. person yeah. that's called a prosthetic pickup if it was supposed to be about how they look and look real like their skin yeah. Then but then it might, you don't want to huh. just like a piece of tape, right? Huh. Piece of tape, piece of tape. Yeah. So, how long have you been doing this amazing work? Um, I have been doing this professionally for about 30 years um, and been playing with it ever since I was about 14 or 15 years old. Nice. Yeah. So, what really drives your passion into this type of work? What, let's see, uh, the satisfaction, when it works when you actually have pulled it off. Um, that is, I mean, you know, it, us as artists, we're, we're, we're never sometimes uh, happy about what we end up doing. Yeah, that um, makes sense. But, yeah, but, you know, even, even when somebody else feels it, when somebody else believes it, somebody else you know, doesn't even realize what they're looking at, they you know, find out later that it was a makeup um, or a special okay. makeup, then that's where it gets satisfied. So what is the best part about being in this industry? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad. But um, the good is that sometimes you work with some people that, you know, you get to learn from. I mean, I, I'm, I'm always, uh, I've never, you never stop learning. You, you'll learn something weird, the way somebody holds their brush uh, for whatever reason they do, could change the way you do something. And uh, I, it's, it's forever learning. It's forever changing. Uh, so it's, that's one thing nice. Even though it's like I'm making this person into an old person, like I did yeah. on some other movies, there's always specific challenges challenges for this particular makeup, for this particular person that makes the yeah. impression. Yeah. So what's the coolest part about being in charge of all the makeup for a film or TV show? Um, let's see, the coolest part about being in charge, uh, that you can kind of help design the world that you want the audience to believe in. Um, that is, I think, a, a great sense. Being in charge is a, a nebulous term in ways that usually you're with a team of people and with a good manager, uh, you know, you will utilize everybody's talents in, in every way to, to make, make the world believable, you know, that you're trying to sell. Huh. So how much do you get to create what you want versus being told exactly how the client wants it? Um, it depends. It's really a good 50-50 sometimes. Sometimes the client has no idea. They just know they want something big and scary. Uh, you know, something like a company like Marvel, I mean, they have a whole design team that helps, you know, that has come up with the designs beforehand. Uh, but then you have to try and make it work. You know, try to say like trying to take Oscar Isaac and turn him into Apocalypse, you know, they drew him, but the way they drew him may not work as a makeup. Mm. So you have to find a way to make it work. That makes sense. So what's the hardest part about being a specialty makeup artist? The hours. <laughs> the working the hours. Um, depending upon the projects you get onto and the level of projects, whether it's big budget or small budget, um, you know, uh, sometimes you have weeks and months to prepare. Uh, 
but when I work on something like Dancing with the Stars for Zena Green, her department, um, if I have three days to do something that I might take three weeks to do. So it's figuring out how to make that happen in that short amount of time and to make that happen, which is hmm. usually, usually means working 24 hours a day. Mm, okay. So <laughs> now my dad said that you worked on some amazing projects like Guardians of the Galaxy and The Mandalorian. Now, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but what was your favorite project that you've worked on? You can tell me. Yeah. I've, there's, you know, there's different categories of different films that satisfies the, my favorite. Um, you know, I was involved with uh, Passion of the Christ, which, uh, you know, the company that I worked for, Captive Audience at the time, we did the stuff with the visual effects and the makeup effects. Mm-hmm. So we came up. You know, in house, we came up with a lot of the techniques that we used for the film, um, and that was fun. And the movie itself, I think, depending upon, you know, whatever your beliefs are, I mean, it's just a good movie. You know? And mm-hmm. everything that we helped do on the movie helped sell it. Um, Mandalorian was was a lot of fun. It's one of my favorites because we, you know, we got to continue the Star Wars universe and, and make it. Make it fit into the Star Wars universe, but still make it ours. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know there are some great ones. X Men, you know, doing Jennifer Lawrence's makeup, uh, making that makeup what it was, making her beautiful, making you know, it, uh, so there's, there's too many, too many favorites, too many. Different. Okay, so what did you learn most about yourself while working on these projects? Um. Working, you learn about what you really can do, I guess. Um, and you learn about where your limitations are. And then you learn about ways to remove those limitations so that you can take it further. That's what I've learned. Okay. Now, with your work, you get to work with a lot of famous people. Do you get nervous or become a fan blood with any of the celebrities? Um, good question. Uh, no, um, I don't. Uh, there, are, there have been a couple of times when I have kind of fanboyed out, but usually when it comes to most of the people, you know, it's my work, it's my job. Uh, it's, sure. uh, it's neat in the seat, um, is how I kind of think about it sometimes because it's just, regardless mm-hmm. of who they are, they're there for the same reason I am, you know, to, to put this character onto screen. Um, one of the times that I had a big kind of fanboy moment was uh, I didn't work on him, but uh, I was helping a friend do a makeup for a show that he was running. And I kind of felt a bump in the chair behind me and I kind of turned around and there was Leonard Nimoy being made up as Spock. And, you know, that was truly a moment where, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure if you tried to talk to me that moment, I couldn't have had words because. I mean, that's, you know, you see his picture in every book that talks about makeup. You see, I mean, I grew up watching that TV show and huh. yeah, it's, wow. uh, yeah, yeah, that was a good one. So who is that one celebrity that you would really like to work on? Um, I don't know. I've, I've had a fantastically fortunate career um, mm. where I've had, got to, lot, to do a lot of things on a lot of different people. So. I, I've, I've been lucky. I think I've, I've hit a lot of those marks. I'm, I'm, okay. I would, I'll, how about you? We should turn you into a, uh, a fantastic prosthetic maker. So who can you say was the person that helped you drive your passion the most? Hmm. Uh, one of my early mentors was a man named Steve Johnson. Um, and I worked with him early on and he was the kind of person that we would work on stuff. We would build stuff. We would work 24 hours and you know, 72 hours straight building something. And he would come in Whoa. and be, wow, this is amazing. This is great. Do it again. Um, and for whatever reason, he would have a list mm-hmm. of reasons. So we would have to do it again. And, um, he, he was the one I think who helped not only kind of set a bar for passion, but a set a bar for um, ethic, like a work ethic in this in this community that uh, I 
think has helped me a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, my dad said that you have won a lot of awards, including an Emmy. Can you tell me more about that? Um, yes, that uh, that was a, the first. Let's see, the first award I won was an Emmy award for a television show called Black White, mm. where we took the tea, we took a family of three African American folks and made them look white, and a family of three uh, Caucasian folks and made them look black. And it was kind of a show like walk a mile in my shoes, see how what it's like to to be this color in this world. Um, huh. But it was a, but it was a show that the producers knew that if the makeup did not work, the show did not work. Yeah. So we did extensive testing and incredibly, incredibly uh, tense. I mean, it was just wow. Um, but the makeups at the end of it um, looked really, really good. Uh, some of the people were incredibly passable um, and some of them very passable uh, to where you, you'd walk, you know, like Rose, who was the young, the 16 year old white girl made black into a community room full of black people. And there was no, she was never called out. Whoa, um, so that's cool. It's a, I think you know, the show's out there somewhere. It's out on DVD somewhere. It might be out in the universe interweb. But it, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a fun show. Uh, very satisfying at the end of it. Nerve wracking during it because the whole time we're just waiting for somebody to be called out. And which no one was called out. out. And uh, we, had, we had one person that was called out one time. Mm. Um, uh, and that was about it. And then the rest of them... And, you know, and it was it was a neat experiment in watching to see how people reacted when they found out that not only was this person the person that I thought they were, they weren't the race that I thought they were, they weren't, the, you know, I mean, everything. So yeah, um, yeah. So huh. that, that was a that was a, a I was fortunate to be. Huh. On that project, yeah. Well, can I see the Emmy Award? That's it right there. Wow. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, pretty gold lady holding the world in her hands, I guess. Um, uh, but, yeah. Wow. So. What advice would you give to my listeners if they wanted to grow up and get in the specialty makeup industry? Um, I would say, let's see, my first advice would be to um, watch people, watch things so that you, you basically – Everything and everyone around us is who you got to mimic when it comes to your makeup later on. So uh, you just need to be very observant and you need to practice art and you need to be able to self edit. Um, self correction and self edit is one tool that most people don't have in their in their tool set that they practice a lot. You know, being able to look at something that I've done and think that it looks good bad crappy you know if, if you don't have that uh as something that you use often uh you'll fail because okay. most, everyone, most everyone's gonna always think their stuff is great and yeah it's usually, it's usually, so. so what was that very first job that you ever had one of the very first jobs i had was a bad bad low budget horror movie funded by a bunch of porno people called the cannibal hookers I'm not like the first job you had. <laughs> oh, uh, besides like, being in the film industry? Yes, like okay. Publix or something. Uh, a, a restaurant. I have, mm -hmm. My family, uh, we've owned uh, Chinese food restaurants for as long as I remember. Uh, the first job I had as a dishwasher was working in our restaurant at 10 year old. Wow. I'm 12 currently and... Uh, <laughs> I don't have a job. Well, it's time to get one. <laughs> <laughs> but was there anything you learned from that job that helped you to be a better specialty makeup artist? Um, drive, work ethic. Uh, oh, definitely. Nice. Um, I also I grew up on a farm uh, just outside of Portland. It's just a little family farm. So getting up at, on, at 5 a.m. on Saturday to take care of the animals and feed the cows, water the pigs. Um, you, get, you gain a work ethic that I've carried through to today. 
Hmm, nice. So what message do you want to tell children all over the world about doing the work that you do? Um, whether it's the work that I do or work that anybody does, uh, do it with as much passion uh, and that you can. Um, everything you do should be just top shelf. Don't ever half ass it and don't ever, you know, don't give up. Okay. But when you're not working, what do you do for fun? Uh, you can usually find me working more, um, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, I'm always thinking uh, about how to make something better or different, better. Okay. Um, but you know what? I do enjoy all the time to have my kids. Uh, we go skiing during this winter and Whoa. snowboard. So uh, that's one thing I really enjoy. So do you play video games? And if you do, what's your favorite one? You know what? I haven't for a while, but the last I was playing a lot of was Call of Duty. What type? Uh, Xbox. Xbox. I mean, what type yeah. of Call of Duty? Oh, that was the... I don't remember. So that's the thing I was bad. I don't remember all the different versions of... But it was basically <laughs> one where you're in the big stadium, and it was before the stadium collapsed. And, um, ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, that one. So, what was your favorite book to read? Um, funny thing about me is I don't read a lot of books. Um, but you know, one of the few that are David Mamet wrote a great book on directing, which kind of makes you think about how people tell stories. Um, it's a good question. I have not read a lot of books lately. Huh? I should. <laughs> but, okay. Now, can you tell me that one story? You know, remember, this is a kid show, but that right. one story, well, that you're not supposed to tell me about. Come on, you can tell me. No, that one story I can't. Um, Another one? <laughs> uh, well, I guess preface this by why shouldn't I tell anybody? Uh, That's one be, thing. Yeah, I mean, working on Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Ooh. We're asked to reproduce a character from the first movie, which we did. Was it hilarious doing the makeup again? Um, those mo those makeups in general were good. This particular makeup was one that the director remembered differently, and uh -huh. he said, "Well, that was gonna that's gonna be different, right?" And I was like, "No, that's the way it was." And the director was like, "No, it wasn't. It was this way." And I was like, "No, it wasn't. It was this." <laughs> and I almost got fired. I was very close to being fired that day. Uh, Whoa. But, but, you know, um, yeah, so maybe I wouldn't have stuck to my gun so much and just said something that, uh, you know, the lost things over a little easier. But um, Huh. Well, is there anything else you think my listeners should know about you? Um, nah. <laughs> nah. I figure, uh, you know, I mean, we're all here. Um, we're all here to make films and projects that uh, you know, we're trying to entertain people and make, make people believe of something. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I guess a lot of people who know me know that that's just my true nature of I'm, I'm in it and I give 165%. Hmm. Um, and I guess that's just who I am. There's kind of no, there's no shame in that. And there's no, there is no, there's no looking back. Mm -hmm. Well, do you have a Facebook or a website for my listeners want to follow you? Yes, I have. Actually, the best place to see me might be on Instagram, which is Brian Sipe Makeup. Uh, and my webpage is BrianSipe.com, where I've got a prosthetic line. If people want to just glue stuff to their face, they can go to GotFlesh.com and see that. Okay. Well, what is that one question that you think I forgot to ask you? How tall I was. Well, how tall are you? It's funny because I would say 5'10", but my driver's license is 5'10 or 11. But I think I measured last I was 5'9". So I'm in that shrinking part of my phase of life. Which sucks. I'm 5'2". There you go. I can put my chin on your head. Well, thank you, Brian, for being my special guest. Can you stick around for Math Corners? I Sure. Math's horrible. I'm horrible at math, though, but I'll do my best.
my kids are great at math. <laughs> Tiberius's favorite subject, it's Math Corners! Okay. Let's well, thank see. you, Brian, for helping me with Math Corners. I will do the best I can. Sweet. <laughs> well, this week, we're going to do some more multi-step word problems. My dad is always good at finding new problems for me to solve. And today, okay. we're going to talk about makeup. Math? With makeup, yes. <laughs> So, Joanne, a makeup artist for a movie, needs to work on a total of 50 actors. Joanne has worked on 8% of the actors. How many actors are still waiting for Joanne to work on them? And yes, she's the only one there. Purple! <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, <laughs> first, this is a real-world problem because people do need makeup for movies, but not yeah. sure if just one person does all the makeup when it's, like, over 50 people. But we'll give them a break for the sake of math. Okay. Yes, I would say Joanne's greedy if she didn't hire other people to help. <laughs> uh, so she's got 50 people? Mm-hmm. So out of, out of deduction, I mean, I don't know. An 8%. An 8%. percent I think I can guess. Yes. She's done that. I think she's done 12 people. No. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll figure that out. So, locked in 12 is 12. his answer. Purple. No, pur locked in purple. And then Purple's final answer. Okay. <laughs> okay, 12's final answer. So, to solve this first, you have to look at your variables. First, you have the number of actors for the movie, and then you have the percentage that Joanne has already worked on. With this, you can now take the number of actors and times that by the percentage to get the number of actors already worked on. So the percentage is 8%, which is in decimal is 0 0.08. So you take the 50 and times that the, by the 0 0.08, and 8 times 0 is 0, and 8 times 5 is 40, so you get 400. But then you have to remember to move the decimal point back, and then you get 4 actors. So 4 actors are done, not 12. Okay. Well, I'm faster than Joanne, so uh, I would have got to go 12. Okay. okay. Now you have the second part. You need to subtract the four actors that are done from the 50 that are needed for the movie. So 50 minus 4 is 46 actors are still waiting in line. That's probably going to take five hours for each one. <laughs> so, so yeah. So, Brian, did you ever see one person doing all the work for all the actors in a movie? No, no, uh, you won't, and you shouldn't. I mean, just because there's there's too much happening, uh, and there's too many people waiting for you. Ah, eh, sure. Now, Brian, my teacher said that I would use math every day. Do you use math in your work? In time, at times, yeah, I think I do use math every day, um, and in, in in just the nature that you just brought up, and trying to figure out like how many people I'm going to need to deal with, how many actors, how many. Uh, you know, stations do I need? How much material do I need? How much? So there is figuring out. Uh, there is math used every day. I don't know about geometry. I don't know about algebra two or calculus, but uh, up through simple algebra, yeah. Sweet. Well, thank you so much, Brian, for your help with math corners. Yes, you're very welcome. Purple. Always go with purple. <laughs> And now it's time for the heart of a lion. As you know, we talk about the qualities of living by the heart of a lion, which stands for leadership, integrity, obedience, and ability. This week, we're going to talk about obedience. For me, I think obedience is being fully committed to doing what is pleasing to God. The qualities of obedience are compliance with a good attitude and respect for the laws. And you know when someone is obedient, when they follow instructions willingly and truly. Well, as you might know, this is not my best virtue. And usually I'm busting my dad for not obeying traffic laws. But this week, I can say that I saw him obeying a very important one. If you remember, a while ago, I interviewed a lady about the crosswalks. Well, they have some new lights on the Orange Blossom Trail, and they turn yellow to slow down and red to stop and blink red to go again. But my dad stopped right when it turned yellow. I asked him why, and he said that the lights really don't matter. 
In fact, the law really, as soon as a pedestrian has one foot on the crosswalk, he is supposed to stop. Since the person pushed the button while stepping into the crosswalk, the light was slower than the person. Other cars kept going, but my dad stopped like he was supposed to. Now that's following instructions willingly and thoroughly. So I can't boss him today. Hmm. Mm. Boy, boy. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> yes. Did you see your use of obedience at all this week? Did I see or use obedience this week? Although I gotta say, I'm gonna speak to uh, your dad's moment of obedience, um, which is which is good because I think most of the time in that particular instance, when somebody steps uh, onto the street uh, and they feel that they have the right of way and you know expect all the other cars to stop, some of them don't. A hundred and sixty pound person versus a two thousand pound car. Um, who wins? There are times, who will win? So I would never take for granted that this person is going to one be obedient to the law or being paying attention to their driving or the law at the time. Um, but that is something that I, I find disheartening because everybody does just step off the curb and think that somebody's going to stop, and then mm -hmm. wonder why they got smashed. Um, e. So, yeah, uh, you know, I, I think there is, there's there's time for obedience, there's time for non-obedience, but paying attention is maybe a little bit better than I think your dad was paying more attention that day. Mm -hmm. With all of the heart of a lion virtues, which is the one mm -hmm. that you see the most? Because I don't know how many people are that noble anymore. Uh, I, that, that's a good one to try and figure out. Obedient, <sighs> that's, that might be obedient because I think that's what's left. You know, as far as the people, people, very few people have, I don't think they know what the word integrity means, let alone follow it. Um, leadership, maybe I see that because everybody does want to be in charge, but they don't have the integrity to be in charge, nor the ability to learn how to be in charge or, you know, the, the strength and ability of to, to be able to be in charge with um, candor uh, and humbleness. So, okay. Well, we should basically. always try and be lion strong in everything we do, shouldn't we? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can see that. It's, it's a very useful an acronym, so that uh, it's a good thing to follow for sure. Sweet. And that's our show, folks. I want to thank the one, the only, the amazing Brian Sype for being on my show. It has been so much to talk about today. I think we learned a lot about the makeup industry and how amazing this job really is. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Also, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at the Tiberius Show, and please be sure to visit the Tiberius Show on YouTube and subscribe. Also, be sure to listen to us next week on the Tiberius Show with your host Tiberius Boy. That's a wrap, and booyah.